So here's Act 2, and Act 2 is basically about the Treaty of Rome signed in 1957 and what it's all about. But Act 2 has a prologue, and that prologue is a failure. The project of a European defence community, first launched again from France by René Pleven in 1951, which was designed to create a European army. Again, with American encouragement. The European Defence Community project was signed, but then it had to be ratified by the parliaments of the six member states, and it was the French Parliament, curiously, in 1944, which gave it the thumbs down. The purpose of the European Defence Community was essentially, within the context of the Cold War, to allow West Germany to rearm without creating some kind of great big uh, German Wehrmacht Mark II. The project failed partly because pooling armies just came a bit too close to notions of sovereignty for the French to like, and partly because the idea of arming Germany was not altogether a popular one less than ten years after World War II in the French context in particular. So that project died the death, although ironically uh, the Federal Republic of Germany soon did have its own army integrated with NATO from the mid-1950s on. But clearly the failure of the Defence Community Project was a setback for Europe. And so European leaders started thinking in 1955 or so about how they could keep the momentum of European integration going. And at meetings at Messina in Sicily in that year, they hit upon a project which was very much an economic project and was known at the time as the common market. At these preliminary meetings in Messina, there was actually a British representative, not a senior government minister, but a reasonably high up civil servant. His name was Bretherton. And he said, as the project for a common market took shape, he said, well, either the member states, the six, would never agree on it, or if they did agree on it, their parliaments would never ratify it, or if the parliaments ratified it, it would never work in practice. And more or less, goodbye and good luck. The British standing aside once again. Now, of course, I think, in retrospect, that this was a very foolish decision, that if the British had got in on the economic community and had signed the Treaty of Rome in 1957, we would have been able to shape the development of Europe far more than we subsequently did. Still, it has to be said that the British had quite good reasons at the time for wanting to stay aside. In particular, the British still had very strong economic and political and sentimental links to our Commonwealth partners. After all, Australians and South Africans and New Zealanders and Canadians had all fought alongside us in Europe in World War II, and we still had about half of our trade going to these countries. So in certain respects, it made sense to stand aside, at any rate from the position of the mid-1950s and Britain still seeing herself as an imperial power. I think that wasn't forward-looking enough, but then hindsight is a wonderful thing for historians. So what was it about the Treaty of Rome, signed in 1957, that was so new and perhaps unpalatable to the British? What the Treaty of Rome tried to do was to create this notion of a common market or, to put it another way, a customs union. Now, 
A customs union is not quite the same thing as a free trade area. A free trade area really means that you don't have customs duties on products circulating between the member states, and in particular manufactured industrial products. And that's certainly part of the common market created by the Treaty of Rome. The Treaty of Rome commits the six member states to build down customs tariffs on their manufactured goods over a series of phases over about a 12-year period. But the customs union adds something else to that which is called a common external tariff. A common external tariff means that for states outside the six, if they want to export into the common market, into the six member states, then it doesn't matter whether their goods enter, say, in Rotterdam, in Holland, in Antwerp, in Belgium, or in Le Havre, in France, or in Genoa, in Italy, they pay the same customs duties. In effect, this made the six a single player in the world trade context. The six had common positions when it came to world trade negotiations in what was then the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, now the World Trade Organization. It meant that individual member states of the six couldn't go off and negotiate special trade deals with the United States, for example, independently of their five partners in the common market. This is obviously very relevant to the position today. As long as the UK remains in the European Union, it can't go off and negotiate free trade deals, which Brexiters think would be absolutely marvellous. It can't do that as long as we stay within the customs union. So that's the central part of the Treaty of Rome, the creation of the customs union. However, there are a few other things which are of considerable importance which need to be added on. One of them is the common agricultural policy. And this is put in rarely at the insistence of the French. After all, the French are rather worried at being flooded by the industrial goods of their big competitive partner, the Federal Republic of Germany. France, by this stage, is Europe's biggest agricultural producer, French agriculture is forging ahead with tractors and fertilisers and all those things and becoming a big exporter. And it therefore makes sense for the French to say, well, we're not going to accept the free import of German industrial goods without similar arrangements for our agricultural exports. Problem. Historically in Europe, and indeed through most of the developed countries, agriculture has always been subsidised. So a common agricultural policy doesn't just involve free trade in agricultural goods. It also involves some kind of common subsidy for Europe's farmers on the same basis. And this is the outline of the common agricultural policy that's put into the Treaty of Rome at French insistence. The French rarely say, well, we're not joining this unless agriculture is in. Finally, we should come to institutions again. We talked in Act 1 about the four major institutions of the coal and steel community. That is the High Authority, the Council of Ministers, the Court of Justice and the Assembly. The institutions of the economic community, which would later be merged with those of the coal and steel community, look very similar. There's not a high authority but there is a major supranational body charged with taking initiatives to further the development of the community. Now it's called the Commission, a name that should be more, more familiar to you in the European Union of 2017. And yes, there's a Court of Justice, and yes, there's a Council of Ministers, and yes, there is an assembly of delegates of the European Parliament. 
So the institutional configuration is again still there. Perhaps one final aspect which we might mention is the notion of Europe as a means of containing Germany. Germany on the loose is the nightmare of many other European nations. The old ways would have been to arm against Germany to try and contain her, but that had failed on more than one occasion in the past. The European integration method, on the other hand, is to allow Germany to expand and prosper, but within a framework which prevents that from finding further expression in ambitions to dominate by military or other means. That underlies the coal and steel community. It also underlies the development of the European Economic Community, or Common Market, which comes into operation in 1958. That's the end of Act Two.